Good evening, ladies and ghouls. Welcome to the scary version of the Infinite Library, a podcast where the books never end, and neither do you because you're a ghost. Ooh. <laughs> hey, everybody. Yes, uh, back to normal voice, John. If you prefer scary voice, John, sound off in the comments. Oh, wait, we don't have those. Yeah, so welcome to episode two. As you could probably tell from the introduction, this is the first episode of uh, our horror-themed month for October. I know our first episode did uh, come out in October, technically, but we intended for it to come out in September, so that's why that was. But as we will learn as we dig into today's subject, actually not terribly off base. All that matters is that spiritually it's spooky season, and that's why uh, we're coming to you at the second episode with a very uh, spooky and ghoulish book. Yes, uh, Ben, and what are we reading this evening? Uh, the Castle of Otranto. Uh, by Horace Walpole, uh, which is otherwise known as the first gothic novel. Um, so we'll be discussing exactly what is gothic, how does it tie in with English English history at the time, and uh, as well as many of the uh, frights and ghouls and spooks that are in this book, because there are quite a few, actually. There are quite a few of them. Yeah, and there's some jump scares as well. Uh, so we're going to be getting into that tonight. Uh, so yeah, if you uh, you should draw up by the fire. Uh, maybe there's a crackling fire. I'm going to put crackling fire sound effects in right here. Have a big wine glass full of blood. Uh, yeah, a sloshing blood uh, sound effects right here. And uh, so tuck in because we'll be discussing a very scary book. John, so you originally picked Castle of Otranto. Can you tell us why you decided to pick that? Yeah, so it was actually a little bit of serendipity. The uh, first murder victim in uh, The Name of the Rose, our book from last uh, episode, was Adelmo of Otranto, which uh, got me thinking about The Castle of Otranto, a book I had never read before, but I had heard of. I don't know if that was an intentional reference on Umberto Eco's part. It would not surprise me by any means to think that uh, he was referencing this work in that work. But yeah, I was thinking uh, what would be a great, good book for our first kind of October episode. And the first Gothic novel felt like a good place to start. Um, you know, the Gothic is, I think in a lot of ways, the the foundation of, of really what we think of as the horror genre today. I think a lot of horror fiction today is still very gothic in its trappings or uh, gothic in its underlying themes. And we can kind of dig into what that means here in a bit. But I also think that the gothic is really interesting because I think in a lot of ways, this isn't just the first gothic novel. I think the gothic is one of the first examples we have of like a modern literary genre. Before this, there were obviously things like medieval romances or epic poetry that maybe we can call genres in hindsight. But I think that the Gothic novel is one of the first times in history we see like a genre of literature developing as like a marketing category that has these themes and images that are key to the book's appeal to its readers. So I think digging into that is really interesting in terms of kind of what our goals are here in this podcast and just thinking about literature more broadly. We obviously live in a world now where genre is one of the defining things in literature. So yeah, I think reading the first novel and one of the first genres is a, an interesting thing to do. Yeah. Speaking of genre, there's a rhetorician who refers to genre as a social action. And I think that sort of explains why it's interesting. The uh, Gothic being the first social action, a sort of way of looking at the past from the point of view of current, the then current England and realizing that the past is actually kind of, spooky mysterious confusing and intense and for me personally i like reading books from the beginning of we could say of genres or when people were starting to standardize the novel 
because uh, there's a popular theory that the novel only got experimental in like the 60s and the 70s. And usually it was like some swinging white dude who was like, hey, what if we, you know, uh, had a fourth wall break or something? And there's a alternative history that Stephen Moore is one of the guys who's uh, famous for putting this forth, that the novel's been kind of experimental since the beginning. And I think reading a book that came out, this came out in 1764, and it's a little bit after some of the big tentpole great English novels uh, like Pamela. And there's another one. Clarissa. Clarissa. Yeah, Clarissa. And um, this one comes along and it has a very uh, interesting structure, which I don't want to spoil too much, but it's very uh, it's taking a lot from drama and from characters who speak and act their thoughts and their actions are presented in the same way. And there's scenes where it's only a couple of characters speaking to each other. Sort of repeat myself. It's very dramatic. There's there's <laughs> entrances and exits and and characters come in and change the scene and things change in that way. So for me personally, it's useful to read things, you know, from this time period, because I like seeing people take risks when they when they're writing a novel. And I like remembering that, like, the idea of a novel is actually quite fluid and changeable and is not, you know, the sort of stock we might say literary fiction novel we see today, where it's usually about a bunch of characters having revelations. Although that definitely does happen uh, in Castle of Otranto. A lot of revelations in this book. Stay tuned to hear about them. <laughs> Actually, uh, it, it could be considered a book where uh, revelations happen constantly, now that I think <laughs> about it. Um, but but at, the, at least that's my reasons for uh, why I'm interested to in talking about this, uh, as well as what John said about the uh, gothic the beginning of the gothic as a genre. So yeah, that gives us a great place to kind of step back and uh, really talk about like, what what the fuck do we mean when we talk about the gothic, Ben? Did you ever have a goth face? I did. Uh, I, I've i always joked about having a goth face. Like now it's going to be the time I do it. And as the time goes on and on, it's like, I can't just be a, a 50 year old goth. Like <laughs> it's already gone. The time is gone. Like, you know, that's the thing, Ben, the time was gone before we were, well, not before we were born, like a couple of years after we were born. Goth has been pretty well dead as like a musical genre since like the 80s or the, ah, ah, since like the late 90s. Anyway, I'm probably going to have a lot of people mad at me for saying that. Yeah, all the goss, I can hear the goss typing right now, angrily typing, responding to John's heinous comment. I'm sure there's still good goth music. Anyway, so, but yeah, let's let's talk about like what the gothic is real quick. I know that there are probably some people here who their primary understanding of like what goth is, it's, yeah, it's about girls who wear Hot Topic clothes and stuff like that. And that's obviously a lovely thing. And we're all for it here on the Infinite Library. But the literary Gothic obviously influences uh, the fashion and music of the Gothic that emerge later in the 20th century. But the literary Gothic is something a little bit different. And so I do think it's worth it to kind of talk about what that is, where it comes from. And yeah, I think that'll kind of get us into uh, our friend Walpole and his life and times and this book itself. So uh, we talk about the Gothic. It is... Uh, an outgrowth of the Romantic movement. So again, for those who are unaware, the Romantic movement was a movement of uh, writers and poets, mostly in England, but also in places like France and Germany, Western Europe, more broadly speaking, uh, during the kind of 17th and 1800s. They were mostly writing in response to uh, the Enlightenment. So that's kind of the American Revolution, French Revolution type thinkers and writers who were very big on rationality, human perfectibility, uh, the development of society along rational ordered lines. And the romantics were like, okay, that's all great. But when I look at a sunset, it makes me feel things that you cannot quantify with your math. And uh, a lot of people really dug that. And some people dug it even more and went even further. And those people were the Gothics. So the Goth uh, Gothic movement is almost even more of a response to the Enlightenment. So while the Romantics were skeptical of the Enlightenment's belief in human rationality and perfectibility, preferring to focus on human passion and emotion, uh, the Gothic movement takes that a step further. Within most Gothic novels, the world is a playground of passions where humans are, are almost completely rational creatures 
torn this way and that, either by powers beyond their understanding, whether earthly or supernatural, and uh, ghosts, vampires, ghouls, and freaks abound in the shadows of our world. Sometimes they're metaphorical, sometimes they're literal. The Gothic also has a very deep uh, interest in the sublime, which is kind of when you see an image that is so striking, whether in its horror or in its beauty, that you are transported to a another plane of existence almost. <laughs> so if you've ever uh, seen a painting or a sunset that took your breath away, you may have experienced some form of the Gothic sublime. Uh, the last thing I do want to mention there, there's also a historical element here. Uh, the reason people were skeptical of Enlightenment progress and rationality was because of, especially in England, uh, was because of the French Revolution, which was experienced by the pasty Anglos on their uh, swamp island as the Continentals going insane and killing everyone who gave their society any semblance of order, and then having a nonstop orgy for about 30 years. Obviously, that will change your perspective on rationality if uh, lovely thinkers like Rousseau and Voltaire led to the uh, Madame Guillotine. Uh, the reign of terror as well. The, the, the mob <laughs> rule, which, uh, you know, your, your standard English aristocrat would be horrified to even contemplate that, you know, the sort of the people that they view as their lessers would overtake them. That also probably drove some of this. Yes. So uh, actually, the one of the greatest writers of the Enlightenment, a man that I'm not going to say I'm a fan of, but he could turn a turn a word. Uh, the Marquis de Sade had this to say on the development of the Gothic. The genre was the inevitable product of the revolutionary shocks with which the whole of Europe resounded. For those who were acquainted with all the ills that are brought upon men by the wicked, the romantic novel was becoming somewhat difficult to write and merely monotonous to read. There was nobody left who had not experienced more misfortunes in four or five years than could be depicted in a century by literature's most famous novelists. It was necessary to call upon hell for aid in order to arouse interest and to find in the land of fantasies what was common knowledge from historical observation of man in this iron age. That's a, a great quote by Desaad John. I like that he's presenting it as a sort of lack of somewhere to go with the romantic novel. And so there's a need to call upon hell, as he says, and that if you're going to call upon hell, you sort of have to back that up in some sort of way. And so uh, I'm going to share two quotes here, uh, both of which are from the introductions that Walpole wrote. One for the first version, which I want to talk about, has an interesting textual history. And then the second one, but the first one, he notes, terror, the author's principal engine, prevents the story from ever languishing. And it is often contrasted by pity that the mind is kept up in a constant vicissitude of interesting passions. And I think the constant in, uh, vicissitude of interesting passions is one, something that clearly stems from the uh, Gothic being a super romantic, like a supercharged play of emotion. And two, that that's what's going to keep you reading, despite there being, you know, uh, shocks or ghouls or goblins or giants, as we'll see. You're reading because you want to hear, oh, suddenly you're afraid, then you feel pity, then you're afraid again. And that sort of drives you through the novel. Furthermore, in the second edition, Walpole notes that his overall aim for Castle of Otranto was to blend two kinds of romance. He says um, it was an attempt to blend the two kinds of romance, the ancient and the modern. In the former, all was imagination and improbability. In the latter, nature is always intended to be and sometimes has been copied with success. Invention has not been wanting, but the great resources of fancy have been dammed up by a strict adherence to common life. But if in the latter species, nature has cramped imagination, she did not take her revenge, having been totally excluded from old romances. The actions, sentiments, conversations of the heroes and heroines of the ancient days were as unnatural as the machines employed to put them into motion. So in the last bit that quit, he's getting a little involved. But the point overall is that he wants the ancient uh, romance and the modern romance. The ancient one being uh, sort of fantastical and the modern being, you know, realistic. Uh, and he notes like everything else is sort of made up, but he wants both a fantastical element and a, you know, modern explanatory one. 
And yes. I think that's like that's the interesting thing about the gothic is because if you see a goblin like you know, if you were to see a goblin, John, how would you actually react? And, you know, the, the gothic novelist wants a genuine reaction if you saw a goblin. But I think, you know, I, I think it would be kind of funny, personally, if I saw a goblin. But again, maybe I wouldn't make a good gothic uh, novel protagonist. So perhaps, perhaps maybe we're all just uh, too damn inured to the horrors of the world because we get to log on Twitter every day. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, and we need to be shocked by seeing a goblin into realizing that uh, Twitter is not not that great. <laughs> I mean, not enough goblins. So uh, a little <laughs> bit about a uh, Walpole that I think is useful. I want to mention. So uh, Horace Walpole, he was the youngest son of the British Prime Minister Sir Robert Walpole. Uh, he was a novelist, art historian, antiquarian, and a Whig politician. And so being the you know. Th that position in life he had quite an income and if you had an income like that you sort of had to spend it in ways that were interesting to you so he became intrigued by old antiquities and the gothic architectural revival uh which i will mention in a bit i just want to mention that as i said earlier this came out in 1764 which was a little bit after some of the initial tentpole novels um they were known as like some of the first big english novels like samuel richardson's pamela he also wrote Clarissa, Henry Fielding's Tom Jones, and then the initial parts of Tristram Shandy by Lawrence Stern, which uh, are considered to be quite experimental. I, we don't have time to get into that. But, you know, if you say, oh, postmodernism is this, uh, a lot of that stuff actually applies to Tristram Shandy, which came out in 1759. So uh, Walpole thinks he can kind of get in on the novel game. And he wrote uh, he was inspired to write this book because he had a nightmare of a giant hand. Uh, in his own gothic mansion that he built known as Strawberry Hill. Initially, it was a cottage that he built in 1748, and then he spent 1753 to 1776, uh, you know, American Revolution, transforming it into a gothic castle. Uh, and it's part of the Victorian Gothic or Neo-Gothic architectural revival, uh, which is an interesting architectural revival in that England was kind of looking for a shared past uh, and they found it in this and in naming Shakespeare, their national poet. Yeah. So, so when you say Gothic revival, I assume you mean kind of building buildings on the model of like old, like medieval cathedrals, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 And specifically the, the, like the sort of um, lots of towers, lots of uh, abutments, lots of like, these were all about sort of like having uh, gaudy protrusions that reminds us of sort of England's past, which isn't so civilized, but was one that we could all agree on, basically. Hmm, interesting. And um, some people think that it was a reaction to industrialism uh, and other people think that the past was even better. So some proponents of uh, Gothic uh, architecture, Thomas Carlyle and August Pugnan, you know, believed in the past or actually was it was better to be in the past. And so this sort of uh, concern with these buildings meant like we should go back there and not be sort of increasingly industrialized. I do wanted to the last thing I wanted to mention, I guess, before we get to the the I guess we could get to the story main is that it wasn't like initially it was presented as not being by him. Yeah, uh, so kind of like the book we talked about last week, this book opens up with a kind of fake medieval manuscript as its framing device. Uh, the book I see was sold originally as The Castle of Toronto, a story translated by William Marshall, gentleman from the original Italian of Onufrio Moralto, canon of the Church of St. Nicholas at Toronto. So, yeah, this was initially sold, I don't think, in a way that uh, probably was meant to be particularly convincing. This was a translation of a much, much older text. Uh, so we have kind of a meta element here at the very start. We have the passing of something very modern and something very old, uh, which is, I think, very interesting. And uh, that fake Italian name is literally him just sort of transposing his own name. So uh, Onufrio oh. Moralto, a uh, Hori Horace, uh, um, Moralto means a high wall. 
Uh, so it literally means Horus upon a high wall or a, a wall that's a pole high. <laughs> so so he came up with a, a, it's a Mamma Mia version of his name. And he was like, that's the guy who wrote this book, not me. Uh, I just translated it. <laughs> so. Wow, that is very cool. And specifically, uh, th- the initial reviews. So the next edition after it sold out, because it sold very well, he said it was written by him and he subtitled it a gothic story. So the first edition, a critic said, um, however, as a work of genius, invincing great dramatic powers and exhibiting the fine views of nature, the Castle of Otranto may still be read with pleasure. Uh, but then when it comes out that actually Horace Walpole wrote this and was pretending to be an Italian, uh, but when, as in this edition, the Castle of Otranto is declared to be a modern performance, that indulgence we afforded to the foibles of a supposed antiquity, we can by no means extend the singularity of a false taste in a cultivating period of learning. It is indeed more than strange that an author of refined and polished genius should be an advocate for reestablishing the barbarous superstitions of Gothic devilism. Incredulous OD, uh, which is Latin for I disbelieve and hate, is or ought to be a charm against all such infatuation. Under the same banner of singularity, he attempts to defend all the trash of Shakespeare and what that great genius evidently threw out as a necessary sacrifice to the idol of the blind crowd he would adopt in the worship of the true God of poetry. So uh, that guy really got mad that he got hoodwinked. Uh, and I wanted to include <laughs> that to point out that uh, it's funny that this sort of controversy. Yeah. As John pointed out, passing a modern thing off as an old thing got some critics and then they got really mad about it. Yeah. Wow. Some things never change, huh? Yeah. People uh, don't like being tricked, especially when they think uh, a, a, an old thing is actually a new thing. Then what do you say we take a quick break here and uh, come back and talk about the book itself? Sounds good. We'll be back. everybody we are back so all right it is time to actually get into the text i know you've all been waiting uh with bells on uh to hear us actually talk about the book so we're going to talk about the damn thing so i think that given the age of this book i think it is important to just kind of do a brief overview of the plot of the text so let's just give you guys a brief synopsis. Like I said in the first episode, this is a podcast that uh, we don't care about spoilers. So listener beware. Yeah, I'm, I'm um, sorry for going to spoil a uh, more than 200 year old book. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so you picked the wrong podcast uh, if, you, if, you, if you were holding out for a, a book written in yeah 1764. So. All right. So we open on uh, the backwater Italian province of Otranto, which is currently ruled over by the family of one Count Manfred. Uh, Manfred is a bit of a prick from the beginning of the book. We are told that he has two children uh, with his lovely wife, Polita. He has his sickly, uh, weak, pathetic son, Conrad, and his beautiful, chaste, virginal daughter, Matilda. Manfred has arranged for the his son to be married to a princess by the name of Isabella, uh, who is well known throughout all of Italia for being uh, beautiful, so beautiful. Um, however, on the day of his nuptials, which is also his freaking B day, Conrad is killed in a somewhat unusual manner. 
Honestly, it's sort of like a um, what are those movies where people get killed by like falling fans and uh, Final Destination? Isn't that? Yeah, it's a Final yeah. Destination ass kill because basically a servant runs in and the servant is shocked and everyone's like, why is the servant so shocked? Now I'm shocked. And they're like, something's happened to Conrad. And basically Conrad, the weak, sickly uh, son, was crushed underneath what is described as a giant helmet. Uh, the word basically uh, Walpole uses for this is a cask. So he is crushed under a giant helmet, which is apparently it's fallen from the sky. It's unclear where it's come from, but it's basically crushed poor Conrad and killed him. Yes. And Manfred, perhaps unsurprisingly, given the circumstances, does not take this very well. Uh, Conrad is his only heir. And so he immediately becomes obsessed with the idea of marrying his now deceased son's fiance and siring a new heir on her. Unsurprisingly, the beautiful Isabella is not very into this. And she tries to run away and uh, flees into the dark, horrible catacombs of the castle. It is there that she meets... I guess you would call the hero of our story, Theodore, uh, a peasant lad who has been blamed for uh, the death of Conrad, really for no discernible reason, just because he's a little lippy with Conrad. And so Conrad decides that he's responsible. Yeah, lippy with Manfred. Yeah, Manfred's like, uh, like you, that's it. I'm going to put you under the cask, which yeah. also is sort of hard to understand exactly. But he says, uh, we're going to confine Theodore underneath the cask. Uh, and he will have no food. And I guess somehow they're able to get Conrad's mangled body out from under there. Uh, but anyway, part of the cask falls off and breaks a hole in the floor. And then he is able to randomly meet up with Isabella, who's fleeing through the sort of bowels of the castle to make it to the church, where presumably Manfred will not be able to um, basically get at her. Yes. So uh, they do escape. Uh, Manfred continues to search for Isabella, attempting to slake his horrific lust while he is also trying to convince his wife to divorce him. At some point uh, down the line, a party of knights arrive at the castle, one of whom is known as the Knight of the Enormous Saber. Uh, he has a saber which appears to be large enough to match the giant helmet that has fallen in, in the courtyard. The Knight of the Saber arrives, and he is there to bring Isabel back to her family. Conrad hems and haws and misdirects. They eventually do find Isabella. Uh, it comes out that the Knight of the Enormous Saber is actually her father, Frederick, who had been on the Crusades, and is actually the legal heir to the province of Otranto, which was usurped by Manfred's family when the uh, good Count uh, Alonso the Good died uh, a couple centuries previously. Wait, no, he was murdered. When Manfred and his family usurped the province from uh, the Count Alonso the Good, basically Manfred was trying to marry Conrad to Isabella to get a more legal claim on, on this province that his family has usurped. He attempts to convince Frederick to allow him to marry Isabella by allowing Frederick to marry his daughter Matilda, who has fallen in love with Theodore in the intervening chapters. It's noted also that uh, Matilda loves looking at a picture of Alonso that's in the castle. And then when Matilda sees Theodore, she goes, wow, it looks like Alonso. Um, and then the, that gets explained later. But but yeah, Matilda has fallen in love with Theodore. And uh, unfortunately, Matilda has promised Matilda to or no, Manfred has uh, promised Matilda to Frederick. Uh, so they're basically so that he gets to marry Isabella. There are some more contrivances as these two hideous old perverts attempt to slake their lust on beautiful women. Uh, Manfred is driven mad by ghosts for the most part and murders his own wife, murders his own, no, murders his own daughter. His wife dies of grief. Theodore is revealed to, in fact, be the rightful heir to Otranto through Alonso's secret wedding with a character who is never mentioned up to this point. He uh, approaches the castle, and at that point, 
uh, the giant ghost of Alonso, who is the one that, that the sword and the uh, helmet have belonged to this entire time, appears out of nowhere, destroys most of the castle, ascends into heaven where he's met by Santa Claus, and uh, yeah, basically tells everybody to be good for goodness sake. And then the book kind of ends. Yeah, the book ends. Manfred uh, punishment for his lust is consigned to a uh, a monastery, I believe. Hippolyta dies suddenly. We didn't mention that. Uh, and then unfortunately, Manfred, since he killed Matilda, Theodora can't marry Matilda. And eventually it ends by saying the only person who really understands uh, Theodore's sor sorrow is Isabella. So then uh, basically Theodora and Isabella end up getting together. And that's how it ends, more or less. But unhappily. Yeah, uh, they're unhappily getting together. The castle's been destroyed by a giant knight. We are told, by the way, in the beginning that um, the sins of the father are visited upon his children. And that sort of comes to pass at the end. And uh, Walpole, pretending to be the guy who didn't write this, goes, uh, I wish there was a better moral, but this is what we got. <laughs> so, And that's basically how it ends. Yeah, so obviously that is a lot of story there uh, for what is actually a pretty slim novel, a little over 100 pages, at least in my edition. But I think we will kind of fill out the gaps here as we keep talking. So bear with us, listener. We are still learning. Yeah, so Ben, I uh, know you wanted to talk a bit about kind of the way that realistic and supernatural elements play with each other in this book. So obviously we have this giant ghost. We have these supernatural artifacts appearing from the sky. Uh, tell us a little bit about, about what's going on there and, and what you think about that. So one early scene that sort of uh, typifies that is that when Manfred is basically telling Isabella for the first time that he wants to marry her, Isabella views this as incest and uh, the scene gets extremely tense, at which point I believe uh, a the picture of Manfred's father starts moving basically as Isabella is trying to flee. And it's a moment where if you weren't already put off by the fact that this character had been crushed under a giant helmet, suddenly the picture is talking and Manfred basically reacts in a way that I would describe as realistically where he goes, well, I, I guess I should do what the picture is telling me to do. <laughs> and he ends up sort of interacting with it the same way Hamlet interacts with the ghost of his father. If anyone out there has read a Hamlet where he goes, uh, whatever you say, ghost and everyone else is like, well, what's going on? This is weird. And he goes, you know what? This ghost is trying to tell me something. What? Let, I'm going to, I'm going to interact with the way that it, like it will communicate something to me. And so that's like an early instance of like a character reacting quote unquote, realistically to something that is supernatural and unexpected, you know, and everyone else of course freaks out when the, the, Conrad gets crushed under the helmet, but having Manfred be like, ah, oh, my, this ghost knows my evil designs and sort of like is led on by that way as Isabella is trying to flee from him. Uh, it's sort of a, 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 I would say a tension the book kind of plays with all the time because like also like when Theodore and when, when Isabella runs into Theodore initially, when he's, you know, in the bowels of the castle, she thinks it's Conrad and she screams. So characters are always sort of like, Miss, uh, miss seeing each other or seeing something fucked up and spooky happen and then either freaking out or going, you know what, maybe this is trying to tell me something. And that's sort of like a, an interplay that happens, you know, in throughout the entire book. Well, I think it gets into, again, kind of the idea that this is a ancient story. This is from a time kind of before science. So this is an enchanted world. This is a world where people see things and they at some level, don't question them in maybe the way we would. They see this big cask fall on this man and uh, kill him. And there's not somebody like, there's no Sherlock Holmes character, or perhaps uh, William Baskerville stroking his chin and being like, but how could a cask that large fall from the sky? There is a, a an understanding here that there are higher forces, supernatural forces at play in the world. And they have their own motivations that are obscure to human beings and probably not always in like our immediate interests, which I, I think is very 
Yeah. Yeah, very, very interesting. I think, again, kind of looking at this as the first gothic novel, like, I think that a lot of horror fiction relies on that sense that there is a another world outside of ours and that what it is doing has unforeseen effects on our world. <laughs> and also um, that... In trying to contemplate these, we often experience things that can't be described. Uh, several times, a Walpole basically goes, this emotion was too intense to describe. And in one of those, uh, one character we didn't mention in the summary, Friar Jerome, who is actually Theodore's long-lost father, at one point when Manfred is like, all right, Theodore, it's time to die. Uh, I'm mad at you because you yelled at me and questioned my oh, absolute authority. And Fr Friar Jerome is there and they he removes his shirt and he has like a marking. And Friar Jerome immediately recognizes him as his long lost son. And Walpole says the, the emotions were too intense to describe. And so he also does that when, you know, uh, something scary happens. Or, for instance, uh, later when Manfred almost catches up with Isabella, he's interrupted by these two bumbling servants who describe seeing a giant, um, a, a giant knight, basically. And uh, they're like, it's too horrible to describe. We just saw a giant knight. And Manfred's like, what are you talking about? And then there's like sort of a comic scene that happens. So, yeah, like the supernatural exists. Can we understand it? No, it is too frightening and uh, to behold almost in some way. I mean, I was almost getting like in, in the scene you just described with the servants and the giant, there's almost like a Lovecraftian element to it, which yeah. kind of going back to, again, like how the stuff we think of is really new, like isn't, um, you know, I, I found that just a very cool scene, like the idea that, yeah, you see you see this fucked up ghost giant knight in like this big creepy chamber. And yeah, like your your response is not like, well, let me deduct what's going on here and figure out like how this is possible. It's like, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck. And yeah, your brain just shuts down. <laughs> like that's that's the experience of like the sublimity of horror. <laughs> like, I can't think of any other way to describe it. Like it's the the fleeing of your rational faculties, not the like excitement of them. Yeah, and specifically, uh just a little bit from when it's Diego and and Jacques, I think, or Jacques. Um, basically, they show up um, and he goes, uh, What new absurdity is this? cried Manfred. Give me a direct answer, or by heaven. Why, my lord, if it please your highness to hear me, said the poor fellow, Diego and I, yes, and I and Jacques, cried his comrade. Did not I forbid you to speak both at the same time? said the prince. <laughs> you, you, Jacques, answer, for the other fool seems more distracted than thou art. What is the matter? Uh, my gracious lord, said Jacques, if it please your highness to hear me, Diego and I, according to your highness's orders, went to search for the young lady, that we might meet the ghost of my young lord, your highness's son, God rest his soul, as he has not received Christian burial. Sot, cried Manfred in a rage, it is only a ghost that thou hast seen. Oh, worse, worse, my lord, cried Diego, I had rather seen ten whole ghosts. <laughs> and then eventually he says, um, I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, well, he he talks about seeing a giant knight. Anyway, the this is all by, by the way presented in one long block, like so yes. he doesn't break oh lines God. for dialogue. It's all one block where people are talking and thinking and feeling, all presented in the same lines, uh, which I think is an interesting method to sort of like for me when you read it, it really puts you there in what the characters are feeling because you're you're not getting a break for dialogue. Yeah, it's almost stream of consciousness in the way he he writes. Like, yeah, stage directions are, are in there. Like, it'll just be in the middle of the dialogue. It'll be like an interjection by another character. And then the dialogue will keep going. <laughs> and like those two guys are presented uh, talking over each other, which is meant to be sort of like a comic break. Uh, and then eventually yeah. they say like, oh, they saw a giant knight that was again, it, it, it was uh, worse to see the giant knight. He had rather had seen 10 whole ghosts. <laughs> so prose in this book is really interesting. You know, there's the the part you just mentioned there about the the very long yeah breaks of 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 text with no breaks for dialogue there's also no like punctuate like special punctuation for dialogue like there's commas but there's no like quotation marks like we'd expect today which i am frankly not 100 percent sure what was like common parlance at the time i don't that was kind of a uh an anachronism i don't know if that's supposed to make it more medieval or if that was how writing was was done more back then but I also think there is something very, very interesting here in terms of, again, like you said, the, the comic break here, like it's very Shakespearean. Like there are, yeah. this is kind of 
this is a very theatrical book. Like you have these this tragic story going on on the one hand, and then you have these, yeah, kind of Shakespearean clown characters just coming in and bumbling around to give you like a nice break for a minute. And they keep interrupting each other and Manfred says, stop interrupting each other. And then they do it again. And then he gets mad <laughs> and he points to one of them and goes, you, you're the only one who has to talk. Like, like you can, you can just sort of see the stage blocking happening, like, like enter stage right. And then they're like, they're like on both sides of Manfred. And he's like telling one of them to stop talking. Yeah, and like you were saying earlier in kind of our history section, like this is a time in English history where they're really embracing Shakespeare as like a nat national figure for the first time. And so I think this theatricality and these Shakespearean elements are absolutely part of Walpole's like intention here. Like yeah, even sitting yeah. it in Italy like felt kind of like a Shakespeare device. You know, this is this is the you know, it's not set in England. It's set in kind of this this imagined Italy that you know you could you could a absolutely see this being the same place that, um, you know, what a, a Shakespearean play is happening. You know, three castles over. It's the same kind of thing where you have these weird turns of fortune and long lost sons, and then oh, the long lost son is actually the long lost grandson of somebody else. <laughs> A guy with a giant sword shows up that we haven't seen before the the night of the, the big sword. <laughs> so, well, that's almost more of like a Don Quixote thing, which I found yeah. hilarious. <laughs> I do wonder if uh, Walpole had read Don Quixote because there is like a certain like you said, there's a comedic element here. Like even when the cask falls on Conrad at the very beginning of the book, it is supposed to be this very like uncanny, like unsettling scene. But it's also very funny. Like, oh, you have this like dweeby wimpy little prince and then all of a sudden like a fucking monty python sketch like a giant helmet just falls on him and just squishes him like a fucking bug like and, and manfred is telling isabella he's like i'm glad he's dead <laughs> like 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 i get to marry you now <laughs> like i never really liked i, I never liked my fail son <laughs> like you know like, <laughs> <laughs> or uh, I really found the bit hilarious when the knights do show up. There's the scene where Manfred is like, he takes them aside and the knights have all made like a great show of like being like very like quiet and not talking. And Manfred just like keeps giving this monologue. And there's this bit where the knights are, it's just like the knights look to each other and wonder where this speech was going. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so just, yeah, very, very funny book in addition to having some very, very striking images in it. I really love the way that he uses just the the image of, of the cask, of the big sword, of the giant. Yeah. To really just kind of hammer home, like, yeah, the the strange world we find ourselves in. I feel like a lot of modern horror fiction gets a little too tied up in kind of fantasy and like finding rules and explaining things. Yeah. And this book really doesn't do that. Like it really just wants to show you this, this bizarre image and just let you kind of have to sit with it. There are scenes with the cast towards the beginning of the book after it's fallen where the plumes on it kind of take on this animated quality and they they seem to react to what people are saying, nodding or, or shaking, kind of in agreement or disagreement with what's going on in the story, kind of like almost in a Greek chorus kind of way. Yeah, they make a dry rustling noise at one point, which like I thought was great sort of like sensory sound, like the rustling noise of the the plumes on the cask uh, is like yeah. that's, that's just good horror writing right there. And Walpole's like not over explaining himself like he is not like telling us the mechanics of any of this it's just happening and yeah. you just have to deal with it happening which i think is like always the best horror when you can't explain it and it's just a thing you have to like learn or fail to deal with and yeah i i just really really dug that in this book yeah other things that happen like that uh a statue bleeds at one point when they're when manfred is discussing his plan to you know, marry uh, Isabel and marry off Matilda. Uh, Frederick, when he's sort of contemplating marrying Matilda, he walks into, I believe, a room or maybe it's the church and he sees a figure he hasn't seen. And the figure in a jump scare that actually kind of got me basically turns and looks at him as a skeleton. And it's like, do not marry Matilda. And like the fact that it's presented sort of 
in initially like without telling you, oh, there was a skeleton. It's like a figure we haven't seen before is asking, are you Frederick? And he's like, yeah, I'm Frederick. And then turns to the camera. It's a skeleton. And like it says, do not marry Matilda. Basically, it's a it's a nice bit of jump scare writing that, again, is it unique from a book from 1764. Yeah, I kept trying to like put myself in the shoes of someone like reading this in the 1700s. And obviously, like to kind of our modern sensibilities, it's like Ben, you and I have watched like I'm sure a bajillion horror movies between the two of us. We're like a little harder to probably like get. I mean, even you said that that like kind of got you. But I think about like what's it like reading this if it's like, oh, like most of the literature you'd read, it's like Clarissa and the Bible. <laughs> like, what was it like picking up this book? <laughs> and like Cl- Clarissa, uh, which. No, Pamela. I've only read parts of Pamela, but Pamela is presented as letters. So it's like somebody's always like, oh, this happened to me. Oh, this happened. And like here you're like reading something as like all of the shit sort of like unfolding in front of you. And like, you know, it's scary. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, and the, you know, I, I read a I read a really great review of this uh, from the Yale University Library Gazette by uh, an author named John Riley. We'll link it in the show description. But he uh Pointing out also that the the initial printings of this had some really marvelous illustrations in uh, them, which I think also really kind of went that extra step to, yeah, really immersing like the reader, especially at the time, like in this book. The edition I had did not have any illustrations. I kind of wish now that it did, because I these images are, are are really beautiful, and I do think that like there's a visual element to horror that this book does a really really good job doing as much as it can with just text. But I think that, again, from the standpoint of trying to put myself in that, the reader at the time, it's like the pictures, I imagine just like being a, a, a yeah, pasty, gross English frog person uh, <laughs> sitting by my dog fire reading this book and screaming uh, <laughs> as I am scared over and over again by all the the ghouls and ghosts contained therein. There's also like a mistaken identity bit where Theodore is defending, um, I believe it's M- Isabella or and he accident. Well, no, it's Matilda, I think. And he accidentally kills this knight who shows up, who turns out to be Isabella's father. Um, no, he doesn't and, kill him. Oh, well, yeah, he wounds him, right? So he doesn't. Oh, he doesn't kill him. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, but like, there's the mistaken uh, identity bit, which also seems very Shakespearean. But yeah, the sort of I think there's also a shock of the sort of the knight coming back at the end and like wrecking the walls of the castle. It's like a big reveal. If we've seen parts of this giant knight in pieces, like, Oh, we've seen, you know, the, the cask we've seen the sword. We later, they talk about the hand. Uh, and well, the nightmare originally was a hand, but like the, basically it's all sort of revealed in pieces and the entire portrait is presented at the end in sort of like a, and everyone is just sort of too shocked to react more or less as uh, the night comes down. I was thinking of more like, oh, they're assembling Voltron in the courtyard. Like all the all <laughs> yeah, the bits yeah. get together and then at the very end, they all combine and destroy the castle. I, honestly, can you imagine William of Baskerville saying, well, the only thing I can deduce is that a giant knight is going to show up later. And Anzo's was <laughs> like, what are you talking about? And he goes, well, that's the only explanation. And so like, like, why else would, why else would this be like, there's a giant fellow just over there. <laughs> like, you know, like, so like, <laughs> <laughs> and then like and then when oh they when God. they assemble the Voltron, he's like, I'm I'm in the wrong book. I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> like like <laughs> <laughs> I you almost wish that there was a, a character like trying to solve the like a Scooby-Doo gang in the background here trying to solve what's going on. That that'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, and they'd like they'd be friends with Isabella and stuff, and they'd be like, Man, this Manfred guy sucks. <laughs> like, yeah, like <laughs> <laughs> up yours, old man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> getting getting jailed into the castle for uh for talking <laughs> ill to the old man i mean frankly we kind of have a scooby gang or i mean they're not trying to solve the mystery necessarily but we got like all these hot teens around they just need a talking dog yeah i mean like we didn't even talk about bianca who is um matilda's i guess maid servant and she also has her own comic scenes where like she's afraid to tell matilda what she really thinks and it's sort of like a reveal like just tell me you know so so I think we've covered the supernatural elements of this and the sort of 
need to make sense of it and that sort of affinities with modern horror. I think uh, John has presented a sort of way of making sense of it that sort of handles the sort of weird supernatural elements. John, I believe you have a Freudian reading. In fact, I do. Uh, <laughs> so this book is uh, it's horny, folks. It's about an old guy who wants to fuck, and that is always going to be a fruitful sort of story to to bring our friend Miss uh, Doctor Freud into. So I'm gonna just kind of lay out my my thought here. I I think that this novel, and in fact a lot of gothic novels, is about how uh, old men wanting to fuck is disgusting and evil. So we start off the story. Obviously, we have Conrad. Uh, who is the weak, sick, sickly, pathetic young man who is killed. And what does that do to his father? Does it uh, remind his father of his immortality and perhaps get him to focus on uh, better things in life? No, it causes him to have a midlife crisis. And he decides, oh, I'm, uh, I, can, I can still uh, go on living forever. I can I can get back to fucking and have another son who will carry my uh, race on into infinity. I'm not going to die, not in any real way. And so he, yeah, becomes sexually obsessed with a beautiful young woman and becomes a gross creep in addition to just kind of the asshole he was before. That all kind of carries on and on until who shows up but the knight of the enormous saber a man whose sword needs to be carried by a hundred men <laughs> uh yeah if uh, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar but i don't think a giant saber has ever just been a giant saber make of that what you will it is at some point revealed that actually the knight of the giant saber is not the true wielder of the sword. He is merely another gross, horny old man who is nearly tricked into giving away his beautiful daughter uh, to slake his own gross old person lust. And who does it fall to then to set things aright? The primal father, Count Alonso the Good, who was murdered by... Uh, Manfred's family, who then usurped his title, he shows up, sent by God, presumably, <laughs> to set things right. He punishes the unruly children he has left behind and sets his own son up as the true ruler. And he is uh, beyond the sort of temptations of the flesh as well, because he's yes. like from heaven. So he is using that 100 foot sword for one purpose only, and it is not fucking. <laughs> well, and so in some ways, yeah, it's a, a story about how horrific it is to have a uh, sexual desire, especially if you're an old man and it, your family is sort of past its prime. Yeah, yeah. So uh, a lot of gothic novels are, are have have kind of shades of that. I just finished up reading Uncle Silas by Sheridan Le Fanu, which is another one about a creepy old man and a uh, new by a young woman, uh, which was a lot of fun. So, uh, yeah, I, I feel like the the kind of critique there to kind of get serious for a minute. There is a lot of gothic fiction that focuses on, yeah, creepy old men and nubile young women. I feel like it's very much like a critique of patriarchy, especially at the time. Uh, obviously, we still have a long way to go in terms of uh, uh, gender in our society. But the Victorian era and before was obviously even worse in a lot of ways. And... <laughs> Yeah, it definitely feels like there's a, an element of social critique here in terms of the the power that men have over women, especially young women, to marry them or marry them off as they choose and kind of condemn them to these lives of sexual servitude to some degree uh, when they'd much rather be uh, fucking beautiful people their own age. Which uh, gets, gets thwart, thwarted uh, as well because, like, you know, Theodore wants to get with Matilda and then that is thwarted by one Manfred killing Matilda, but also, you know, Theodore uh, basically having to marry Isabella. And so, like, even this sort of, like, natural union also gets thwarted by the plot of the Gothic plot, kind of. The Gothic novel, you know, there oftentimes the the evil is is 
vanquished in some way. Manfred is is cast down from his throne and punished. You know, at the end of Dracula, they kill Dracula. Um, you know, plenty of other examples we could riff on, but I don't want to bring in too many other texts here. We've already probably brought in too many. But it doesn't set the world aright. Like there's always this sense of incompleteness at the end. Yeah. Even though in this case, it's it's very literally like this ghost comes up and then ascends to heaven. It destroys the castle in the meantime. And it it is a force that that upends the corruption of the old order, but does not set a new order that is necessarily going to solve all the problems in place. You know, there's definitely an implication, I think, that Theodore is going to be better than Manfred, but he's not like going to solve the fact that, you know, Toronto seems like a, a relatively shitty place to live, <laughs> even for him. Yeah, the, the 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 Italian backwater of Toronto. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, Ben, I know you shared with me a uh, film adaptation of this. I was a little surprised when you sent me that. To my knowledge, this has never like been a book that's received kind of a proper like big screen adaptation um, in the way that that maybe like again like a, a more well known novel like yeah Dracula or Frankenstein might. But there has been at least one. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that film? Yeah, so it was adapted into a short film by uh, Jan Schwunkmeyer, who is a Czech filmmaker and a big influence on Terry Gilliam, who did the animations for Monty Python. I'm sure you've probably seen them. Uh, they're quite fun and charming, and they have a sort of life of their own. And he did his own adaptation of this um, in a similar way, but it's bookended by this sort of pseudo documentary explanation where uh, a guy is interviewing a sort of uh, academic like who is uh, purported to find the real castle of a Toronto in uh, basically, you know, I guess he said, I think he says it's somewhere in, in, I don't know if he says where it is, but he says he's found the well, real it's, one. It's, yeah. it's definitely implied to be like somewhere in Eastern Europe. I, I want to say it's yeah. either it's either in Czechoslovakia or maybe Serbia. I'm struggling to remember exactly off the top but of my he, head. But like, he shows you the artifacts and the interviewer is like, oh, that's very interesting. And there's documentary footage of him sort of excavating. Uh, so anyway, they 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 in in between this is the sort of animation of the events we've described. Uh, but there's a big reveal basically at the end uh, where you see the giant hand. And so there's a shot of him interviewing the uh, historian and then dirt gets knocked down. The camera swings up and you see like a giant gloved hand sort of emerge out of this ruin to sort of demonstrate that, uh, yes, this is real. The castle is real. And so is the giant knight. Uh, and it's a great sort of like, I would say a Gothic kind of ending to sort of shock you out of the sort of narration and the pseudo documentary science uh, into the sort of horror of the giant hand. And then immediately after that is uh, footage of the historian putting on like a, a, a what looks like a hand. So it's like you immediately see that they probably just filmed this guy. Uh, but like you get that sort of shock horror reveal right there. Um, it's a great watch. It's only 15 minutes. You can see the influence on Terry Gilliam in the animation. Uh, there's there's pictures of the book itself as well. Uh, so you see the text um, interwoven with the illustration. And I don't know, it's a great little bit. You know, maybe if you're thinking it, you're like, I don't know if I want to read this. Definitely give it a watch. It's on YouTube. Um, Castle of a Toronto, Jan Schwunkmeyer, I believe is his name. Awesome. Yeah. So, Ben, uh, I think we got one more one more thing I want to talk about before we kind of close out for today. So obviously, this is our second podcast episode, right? Yes. So we're we're pretty close to hitting the big time, like just give it a few more weeks and we're going to be putting in our two week notice at our job. Yeah, we're going to be reading ads for Blue Chew. Uh, I'll be asking you, do you like sex, John? <laughs> and, then, yeah, and, uh, and then you'll just have to talk about uh, why you do like sex. And when I do, I love Blue Chew. See, I'm, I'm already doing this. That's what we're in the big time. You're primed. You're primed. But yeah, so obviously we're we're well on our way to being, you know, big wigs in the entertainment industry, right? Oh, of course. So I think that we could speed that up a little bit by uh, doing doing some pitching here. Uh, so obviously, like I just said, like I just said, there there's never been a big screen adaptation of the Castle of Toronto thus far. But let's say uh, that changes and we get contracted by a little film studio called A24 to produce 
an adaptation of the castle of Otranto. Honestly, it's perfect. You got, like I said, we, we talked about, we got sex, we got death, we got uh, skeletons uh, with giants, uh, you know, horror statues bleeding. That's, that's all A24 is. That's, that's our whole stuff. Yeah. I mean, they put out the green Knight. Why couldn't they do this? So Ben, I want to hear if you were if you were the big wig producer at A24, how would you do a Castle of Atrana movie? Tell tell me who you'd have direct, who you'd have, you know, playing these these wonderful characters we've come to know and love in the last uh hour and change that we've been chatting here. So my pitch for A24 Castle of Atranto, uh, you gotta get directed. Eggers. <laughs> Robert Eggers is directing. Okay. And okay. Okay. he's 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 gotta put his own Eggers spin on it, right? So he's gonna be fresh off of his uh I can't believe I think he's doing an adaptation of it, it's some old horror classic. He's fresh off that, he's coming in, he's gonna set Castle Vetranto during the Etruscan period of Italy. This is pre-Romans. They had their own sort of feudal society. He's gonna it, they had polytheism. So there's going to be ghosts, there's going to be pseudo knights, but it's all a true skin. Uh, and who's going to play the evil, uh, lecherous Manfred, but Dave Batista <laughs> in a <laughs> Shakespearean role. Everyone thinks, oh, Dave Batista is the heavy, you know, he only he only has brute force. But no, I think he's got Manfred and so does Eggers. Uh, and so he's going to cast Batista as Manfred. Now, what does that mean? Uh who is Hippolyta? Well, we're getting oh, we're getting some hot Dune casting uh, for Hippolyta. Rebecca Ferguson, who is Paul's mom from Dune, will be Hippolyta. That's going to draw in the sci-fi heads. They'll be like, okay, I want to see that. Uh, then we're going to get some action casting. Who's going to play the the uh, basically the the boy wonder the the heir to be? But uh, Theodore, but John David Washington, the protagonist from Tenant. Uh, he's going to get his own Shakespearean turn as well. Uh, Friar Jerome is going to be Robert Pattinson because I want Friar Jerome to be quoting. Uh, basically, it's going to look different because it's the Trushkins. He won't exactly be a Christian priest, but he will be the holy man. And he'll be quoting about how there's no divorce allowed in a, a, a Trushkin folklore. folklore. Uh, then uh, Frederick the guy who's going to show up with the sword, Bob Odenkirk, of course, (laughs) Bob Odenkirk is going to be displaying his giant sword and saying, wow, what a great sword. Uh, I'd I'd love to marry Matilda and him and Dave Batista are going to uh, discuss that. You can just see it right now. Uh, Matilda is going to be, oh yeah, Florence Pugh, of course. That's why I have down for that. (laughs) So she's got to be Matilda. It makes the most sense. Uh, Now you're probably wondering uh, who... Diego and Jacques are going to be, well, we're going to do a little bit of stunt casting. Eggers isn't happy, but the Island brothers are going to be Diego and Jacques. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a bit to get the, to get the TikTok uh, group, you know, they're, they're in the, the people who watch videos all day, they're in. Uh, and so finally, you're probably wondering who have I not mentioned? Um, I think that, Oh, who is Isabella? I don't remember. Oh, Isabella is Kiki Palmer from Nope. Uh, we want her as well. She's got high profile. Okay, but that leaves who's the guy who's crushed under the giant cask in the first scene? We barely see him. Who's the weak, sickly, fail son? Clearly, Timothy Chalamet. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> Timothy Chalamet gets uh, gets cast to get killed within 15 seconds. You think he's going to be the protagonist? We got a whole stunt trailer worked out, uh, but no, he gets killed in the first 15 seconds by a giant falling bolt uh, knight helmet, uh, and that leaves uh, the rest of the movie to play out. So uh, D- uh, Eggers presenting the Etruscan version of Castle of Toronto, featuring a lot of stunt casting. Dave Bautista as Manfred. It's going to sell millions of dollars. All the kids are going to love it. I mean, it, I, I can't see how it could fail. But if you'd allow me, I have kind of an alternative vision in mind here. Yes. Yeah. What, what is your so, vision? We get, we're pitching two different ones for the big wigs. Yeah, exactly. I mean, whoever doesn't get the pitch deal, I mean, they're they're gonna have to leave the podcast, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, so I'm 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 taking more of a, a, a comedy spin on it. I'm, I I want to do Castle of Toronto as a horror sex comedy. Oh, excellent! So obviously, obviously, this is a movie about how uh, gross it is when old men want to fuck. And this is gonna be a controversial pick. We're definitely courting controversy with this, but we're going to have it directed by 
the grossest old man in Hollywood. That's right. We're bringing Woody Allen in. <laughs> uh, Woody Allen's Castle View, Toronto. That's right. Like I said, we're courting controversy here, but I think it's going to pay off, especially when you we get down the line here for the casting. So, gotta gotta find a gross old man to play Manfred. Manfred's played by Danny DeVito. <laughs> oh, really, man. just yeah, gonna get even better when I tell you he's playing Isabella. Isabella, the beautiful, most beautiful woman in the world, when we played by the real life most beautiful woman in the world, Rachel Snow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So imagine, imagine if you will, beautiful, perfect, gorgeous Rachel Sano being chased by Danny DeVito in in like a dollar store Shakespeare costume with like the big <laughs> collar. He's like, going to be amazing. And like you see his shadow cast on the wall and like, you know, like, like uh, that's perfect. Uh, Matilda will be played by and for kind of a bottoms reunion vibe. We're going to have her played by uh, Ayo uh, Edibiri. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely skewing for a, a Gen Z audience here. We're, we're going to get the boomers with Woody Allen and we're going to get Gen Z with with Rachel Sano and Ayo Edibiri. Um, and we're going to get the millennials with Danny DeVito. It's perfect. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Uh, so Hippolyta, Father Jerome, don't care. Don't not worried about them. They don't they don't fuck. It's not what the story's about. The uh, the Knight of the Enormous Saber, who uh, who's also a gross old man, uh, of course, is going to be played by my favorite actor. That's right. Uh, the real life Knight of the Enormous Saber, Willem Dafoe. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> Yes. So that's that. Uh, and then, yeah, I, I think you're really going to love my casting for Conrad. So the, the character who dies uh, 15 minutes in, crushed by a giant helmet. It's going to be a little controversial again. It's going to be Woody Allen. <laughs> what? <laughs> and here's the great part. We're going to do it practically. And we're actually going to crush Woody Allen with a giant helmet and and <laughs> end him. <laughs> so we're going to uncancel him, bring him back into movies just to put an end to him once and for all. So we can, we can really send a message with this movie. And that's what are the, you like getting killed by a cask? And they're just like, that's a wrap, folks. <laughs> this has been Castle of Toronto. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to shoot that scene last. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I really think it will be an appropriate send off for his career. Wow. And uh, yeah, we just... We'll be done with them. I like the idea of it being uh, like a sex comedy. Like what, what was the, the hours? Did you see that where they were like, Oh, uh, little hours. I love that movie. Yeah. 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 yeah I was like, I, I, that thought crossed my head, but then I just really wanted the, the Rob Eggers, like intense psychological, like, you know, folk mysticism uh, for like some of the, like the kills. But then, yeah, like we got stunt casting too, because Everybody loves stunt casting. So it's the best. All right. Uh, do we want to call it here? Yeah, I think uh, I think that's about all we've got for today. We've we, we've we covered the background. We had some great discussion of what, what actually happened in the novel. And then we presented you with our two, uh, you know, A24 castings of Castle Vitrano. Because honestly, it, it's going to be a. It, it, you think we're joking? They're gonna pick it up. They're they're just looking. They posted on Twitter today. They're looking for more material. Somebody's gonna pitch them a Toronto. It's bound to happen. Yeah, and it's gonna be me and Ben, and then we're gonna be done with you, little people. <laughs> it's the big time, baby. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, uh, yeah. Let's let's uh, get to closing out here. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, this was, like I said, the first of our. Uh, Halloween episodes. We have something really special planned for uh, our next episode. It's going to be our first ever crossover. We are going to be sitting down to talk with the Hot for Creature guys, Dylan and Rob, who are uh, personal friends of mine, uh, about Koji Suzuki's The Ring. We're going to be talking about the novel on our show, and then we're going to be talking about the movie on their show. So please give that a listen. Uh, to both of those thank you all who uh who gave a review or left a comment on our first issue our first episodes excuse me it was really nice hearing from you guys uh and i'm glad you're enjoying it because we're enjoying making it and i just want to say uh thanks for any feedback you sent our way it was much appreciated. 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, please do, if you haven't already, uh, subscribe to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, uh, or wherever you prefer to listen. We're also on YouTube. Uh, and if you want to like and uh, leave us a review, that'd be great. Share the show with your friends. Understand, you know, we're still getting our feet under us, but we really do love making this thus far, and we really want to get it in front of as many people as possible. If you have any ideas, uh, feel free to reach out to us on our social media profiles. I am at Slut Goblin King. Ben, you are at? Uh, it's Ben one week. Uh, yeah, B-E-N and then one, the number. It's Ben one week. Yeah, and that's uh, Twitter, Blue Sky. Uh, I am on Instagram as well. Uh, we're getting social set up for the show, so eventually you will be able to uh, send us stuff there as well. Thank you so much for uh, coming and spending some time in the Infinite Library with us tonight. Yeah, thank you for joining us tonight in the Infinite Library. I'm uh, John. And I'm Ben. Semper Books. Semper Books. Semper Books.